Our main expositor is Dr. Yao Pebi. Dr. Yao Pebi is a medical doctor, a pastor, and immediate former president of International Student Ministries Canada. He's the principal at the executive coaching and consulting company that bears his name. He's the founder and the global CEO of the HUD Group with the leadership development work in over 20 countries in all six continents. He's an authentic leadership authority, integrity activist, and a serial entrepreneur. Dr. Pebi is a catalyst, executive coach, consultant, best-selling author, award-winning international speaker, and impactful intercontinental corporate trainer. Dr. Pebi has authored 15 books, some of which include Youth Power, Financial Wisdom, and Amazon bestseller Thinking Outside the Window. He's physically served in 45 countries on five continents and has been the toast of media groups worldwide, including CNN, the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., CBC, and BBC. He's a fellow of the Aspen Global Leaders Network and the Africa Leadership Initiative. Dr. Yao Pebi is a Lausanne Movement Catalyst and International Director of Quiver. Dr. Pebi is married and blessed with seven delightful children who live in Accra, Ghana and Montreal, Canada. Dr. Yao Pebi will be speaking on the character of Samson. Please give a warm welcome to our main expositor, Dr. Yao Pebi. Wow! How many of you are ready for God's word? Wonderful. Aha, let me make a correction. My name is Yao, not Yaw. <laughs> Yours is a disease. I am not a disease. Okay. So we had a, a little confer, uh, discussion about that yesterday. My name is Yao. Like, wow. Can you try it? Yao. Yeah. Wow. wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Anybody who is uh, Luo? Yeah? I hear if we add an A, it is Yawa, <laughs> which is the same as wow, right? <laughs> anyway, wonderful. So my name is Yao, not Yaw. And I don't, I don't know how come Kenyans don't have that, but in Ghana, a lot of the tribes have day names. So Yao is a boy born on Thursday. Yeah, so tomorrow is my birthday. So make sure you bring presents when you're coming. <laughs> Every Thursday is my birthday. <laughs> yeah. Of course, some of you know a bit of the history of Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, right? Kwame is a boy born on Saturday. Yes, yeah, from my tribe. Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, that's a boy born on Friday. Kofi is Friday, you see? So you can call me Thursday. <laughs> Great. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives light. And that light is the life of men, male and female. And that light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot snuff it out. May the light of your word shine in our hearts today. As we look again at the character of Samson, may we be convicted May we be challenged. Most importantly, may we be changed. May we be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we'll be able to test and approve what your will is in our time, in our generation, for our lives and our leadership. Your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Raise some powerful leaders out of this place. Leaders not only of competence, who are sure of their calling, Leaders who are anointed by the Spirit of God. But leaders who are also ethical, have, comp have, have character, are values-based, are character-driven. Jesus, mold our hearts after you. That we will not only be followers of you, we will look like you. In Jesus' name. Wow, so it's time to get into the word. There's nothing like the word of God, I'm telling you. Uh, 
And again, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a, such a pleasure. I hope you have the slides ready. Uh, I want to introduce a friend of mine who's here. He's a co-worker. He's Kenyan. Uh, but we work together in the International Student Ministries of Canada. And um, he, so he was based in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada, welcoming international students. You know, in Canada, we have about 700,000 international students. And um, Iziku Jacko is his name. So, you want to say hello to them? Well, praise the Lord. Yao recruited me into the International Student Ministries in Canada. And we are now initiating Pan-Africa International Students in Kenya that is going to serve the whole of Africa. And we want to partner with you. Awesome. Great. Fantastic. So yes, international students, there are 5 million international students in the world. About 10% of them are African. 500,000 Africans are studying outside their country of origin. And many of you are going to be international students. I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact. But the question is, what kind of international student will you be? <laughs> will your life be of any consequence to the kingdom of God? We recently did a survey and about half of the international students said they did not see themselves as missionaries, which is incredible. Because in, in China right now, we have about 40,000 Africans in China studying. Let's say half of them are Christian. The Chinese government is paying for you to come and... Oh. Missionaries who don't do anything. Hey. All right, that's not what we're talking about. So we're talking about Samson. We're looking at a biblical case study of this man. We're looking at character-based leadership. Next slide. And uh, some of you have been asking me about, about uh, Africa to the rest. I want to spend a minute or two. Some people say, what is it about? Let me summarize what it's about. So, and I think yesterday, National Director was asking me, why did you write this book? Uh, it's not easy writing a book, but we had to write this. Because 2018, something amazing happened. Africa became the continent with the most Christians in the world. I mean, that's a record that, that Europe has held for a thousand years. See what God is doing in our time. A thousand years. And then about 2014, Latin America crossed that line and became number one. They didn't make much noise about it. And then 2018, Africa happened. Now, this is the amazing thing. We're traveling all around the world. In fact, my co-author and I, Samin Gugi, met in Brazil. We've been, we've been to so many places and nobody was talking about this. You know, when it comes to Africa, bad news is the news, right? If we're, oh, yeah, disaster. Oh, Africa president steals money. Oh, Africa dying of COVID. Oh, then, whoa, somebody has to write this down. And so we documented it, that this is what God is doing. But not only that, by 2050, there will be more Christians in Africa than the next two continents combined. Can you imagine? This is the continent. Look, listen, listen, listen. This is amazing. Look, in our lifetime, things that have been going on for a thousand years are changing. Things that have been going on for a hundred years are changing. Because just a hundred years ago, they called us the dark continent. A hundred, just a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, they, 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 they met in a conference in Edinburgh, in, 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 in England. They, 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 they said, world evangelization in our generation. And yet, they did not invite even one African. There was no African there in that conference. 1910. There was one black person, he came from the States. He wasn't even registered. <laughs> and he's not even African. Are, are you understanding what God has done? See what the Lord has done. Can you see what the Lord has done? What we waited for has come to pass. See what? what? The people that live in darkness have seen a great light. And now it's time for us to send the gospel back to the places where some of them brought it from. But you see, we say the subtitle is from mission field to mission force again. Because Africans have affected nations. In fact, Africa shaped Europe with the gospel in the first century. Before Europeans came the last 400 years to you know, Ghana and Kenya and other places. So we have done this before. God has used us before. And we just say, Lord, do it again. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Who was the guy who helped Jesus carry his cross? Simon, where was he from? 
Where's Irene? Libya. An African helped Jesus to carry his cross. And I believe it's prophetic. God, again, just like he used an African to finish the work on Calvary, he's going to use Africans again to finish the work of world evangelization. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is. I, I, I don't have time to go into all of this. But Acts 13, a lot of you love to, love to quote it. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set up for me Barnabas and Saul. Do you remember that? Acts 13, for the work to which I've called them. There were five people there, Barnabas and Saul, and three others. Do you know two of the five people were Africans? Check your Bible. One of them was called Lucius from Libya. The other was called Simeon the Black. No, check your Bible. I'm not making it up. Your Bible will have in brackets, Simeon also called the black. Or Simeon also called Niger. Niger means black. Nigeria. Niger. <laughs> oh, it's true. Nigger. No, that is the word. Black. Listen, black hands were laid on Paul to send him on his missionary journey. What is this that we are doing? That as well as we are, you know, come and tell us the gospel, as well as we are poor, as well. What is this? Eh? Let, your generation must change that. So we talk about past participation, Africa's past participation in the mission of God. That we celebrate what God is doing right now. Like, what, like, like how in, in 20, by 2050, there will be more Christians in Africa than Latin America plus Europe combined. And then we talk about, but there are some problems with African Christianity. And that is why we are doing this conference. Because some of us, the way we are behaving, God shouldn't send us anywhere. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Because some of you, the way you are sleeping with the girls, if God sends you to America, yeah. <laughs> some of you, the way you are stealing small, small Kenya shillings, you are stealing. When you start getting pounds sterling, what will you do? Hey. Have you seen why we need to come before the Lord and say, create in me a clean heart. Transform me, change me so you can send me. Hey, listen, mission is not first going, eh? Mission is first being. Just like leadership. Leadership is not first doing, oh. Leadership is first being. Listen, who you are is more important than what you do. We're going to see from Samson. In fact, <laughs> you do what you do flowing from who you are. So if who you are is a problem, we have a problem. So what are we going to send? What are we going to send to America? What are we going to send to France? What kind of gospel are we going to send to North Africa? So that's, that's, this is a picture. that's actually my dad. One generation will hand over to the other. He used to be CU president in his days. And then became the, the president of Gaffers, the chairman and all of that. And it's great to see generation to generation. So that's kind of a summary, okay? You can get the book. Next slide. So yesterday we looked at chapter 13 and 14 of, Sam, uh, of, of Judges. We looked at context and calling of Samson. Today we want to look at competence and character. Not only of Samson, because we always bring it to apply to our own lives, like we did yesterday. Next slide. I want to remind you of one of the important things we talked about yesterday, that character development is the heart of leadership. It's the engine of leadership. If character is not there, forget about how powerful your speech is. Forget about how skilled you are. How you can move people. Your character will determine the height, the depth, the breadth of your leadership. Next slide. And we talked about a leader is a responsible person who serves and influences people and planet. This is very important because I find that in the corporate world, because I do a lot of marketplace work, you know, because I've been in the military, in medicine, and all, media, all kinds of things. In the corporate world, they like to say leadership is influence. That's it. It's influence. Leadership is influence. And then I find that in the NGO and the church world, they like to say leadership is service. Oh, leadership is service. But it's both. Pray that you'd have both influence and service. Because there are a lot of people who said they are good, good servants, but they can't influence anybody. That's not good enough. For many years, Ghana prayed for a Christian president. We got one, somebody I know very well, because we went to the same church. He was a lecturer on the campus where my mom was a lecturer. We knew him very well. Very good man. 
Up to now, nobody can say anything about Professor Mills' integrity or that he stole any money. He was a very good servant, but I don't think he was a very good influencer. And you could tell. Pray that you have both. So uh, it's a responsible person. You first need to be responsible for yourself. You can't brush your teeth. You want to lead, see you. Huh? Just put deodorant on. That's too hard to do. But you want to win the nations. First start with deodorant. A leader is a responsible person. <laughs> a resp that's, what, that's what Paul said. Paul said, you want to lead the church of God, start with your house. You can't take care of the people in your house, but you want to take care of God's house. Abba. So a responsible person who serves and influences people and planet. Very important. To achieve a shared noble purpose. And we talked about, next slide, we talked about the context of this. I want to add something to this quickly and then we get into the text. Next slide, quick. So leadership is a process. That's how I define leadership. It's a relational process. So it's not an event. It's a, it's a process, it's a relational process whereby, so we are combining the first definition and this one, a responsible person with character, competence, and care. You need those three, and that's why we're going to talk about competence and character this morning. With character, competence, and care, or some people say compassion. And when you look at it, somebody with these three C's serves and influences people and planet, I left planet out of there, to achieve a shared noble purpose. Think about it. Samson, was he competent? Was he competent? And we talked about that yesterday. Absolutely loaded. He was loaded. Everything from spiritual gifts to the passions, to all the shape and everything. But did he have character? We're going to look at that. Did he have care or compassion? I find it very strange that in all the story about Samson, we don't even find him ever caring about his people. Say, oh, let's deal with the Philistines because we're under... No, it was always about him. We'll come to that shortly. So three legs of a stool. Character, competence, care. And he had one leg. Only one leg. What do you think happened to the stool? All right, next, next slide quickly. So character, a uh, matter of the heart, competence, head, intelligence, strategy, all of that, vision, hands, skills, and care, a matter of the heart as well. Next slide. I like this diagram because, you see, character is a substructure. Character is under the ground. What people see is a superstructure, like this building. All we see is the chairs, how high it is, the stairs. But what is holding this building is underneath. And how high a building is going to go will determine how deep the foundations must go. Those of us who live in cities like New York, Montreal, places like that, those high skyscrapers, they dig deep into the bedrock. There are some metals, there are some steels called piles. And they drive them into the bedrock. I have a diagram, idea. it was too small, I didn't want to show you. But go and Google, for example, the Burj Khalifa in, in, in Dubai, or any tall building, and check how thick the foundation is. And how many feet into the ground? A lot of them, there's, sometimes there's even <laughs> almost as much in the ground as there is above the ground. How deep is your foundation? How deep is your character? Because how high you're going to go is determined by how strong your foundation is. Next, I think I have a couple more things. Yes. Now, a lot of us mix up leadership and management. They are not the same. And I want to show you an example of it. There are many differences, but just this quick one. This is something that is taught in MBA and things like that. So you have to pay me. After this, I'm, collect, I'm taking collection. As you go, everybody gives me $10, $10. But I wanted to show you this because leadership is a highly personal thing. Leadership is not primarily positional. It's highly personal. That is why the person of a leader is important, especially character. Look at this difference, for example. Can you just click, click, click? So leadership is a po po position, management is a positional concept. Just click again. Leadership is a personal concept. You see, um, for a manager, the source of authority is the position. I am your line manager, so I'm asking you to come. Why are you late? Whatever. The source of the authority is the position. But when it comes to leadership, the source of authority is your personal authenticity. I was surprised every time I went to South Africa after Nelson Mandela, that in spite of Mbeki, in spite of whoever else came, Nelson Mandela has so much power. 
It, he no longer had a position. Leadership it comes from personal authenticity. The primary tool of a manager is power. The primary tool of a leader is influence. You're appointed by the organization in management, but you're appointed by the followers. <laughs> so they can give you a post and say, you and you and you, follow him. But you realize that all these others are following him. Because followers decide who we are going to be influenced by. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things. It's funny, but it's sad. When you go to a meeting, and the one who is chairing is not the leader. You see, sometimes, you know, everybody keeps talking to this person. Everybody, like, then he says, hey, 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 talk to me. Address the chair. Address the chair. <laughs> <laughs> the real leader in the room they are talking to and they are agreeing with. And you, are, you have the chair. Keep the chair. <laughs> now, now a man, what the objective of management is, is consistency. Okay? Managers are people, uh, managers are good Anglicans. As it was in the beginning, it's now ever shall be well without end. Uh, that is the job of management, to keep things running. Right? But the job of leadership is to create constructive change. You, if you want to see a difference, is somebody a leader or a manager? Ask them to create change. Just ask them to create change. You see the managers are there. That is the essence of leadership. Change. Followers' response in management is compliance. Ah, but the followers' response in leadership is commitment. Hey, when you are a strong leader, spiritual leader, competent, caring leader, people, it's five o'clock, people are still staying and doing the job. It's commitment. Because they, they, they love the vision, they love the leader, they want to see. Do you understand what I'm saying? But when you're just a manager, hey, have you done this? Have you done this? 4.30, they start packing their things. 4.40, they go to the bathroom. 4.50, they start saying bye-bye to people. 4.59, away. Because you only have power over them between 8 and 5. Hey. And then, it's, the boundary is the you know, contract and job description. But for leadership. So that's why we are talking about these character issues because people will follow you for who you are. For who you are. Not because you have a title. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hey, I hope you get it. How many of you want to be leaders? True leaders. Not just managers. Not just positional leaders. Functional leaders. May God make it so. And that's why it's important to get into the story of Samson. Alright. So, let's get into this. Ay, ay, ay. I have a lot to tell you, eh? So Judges 14 and 15 was read to us. Some part of it was left out, but it's okay. It doesn't, the world won't come to an end because of that. <laughs> All right. So yesterday we realized that like Samson, each of us has been given the spirit of God, right? You have the spirit of God. Each of us has a life story, number two, right? And the third thing is each of us has a unique shape. And all of this totally equips us for our context and for our calling. So we are competent. Tell somebody we are competent. Yeah. It doesn't mean you cannot grow in your competence. We can grow each one of us in our skills and, and our shape. We can get better in our shape. All right? But we are competent. God has made us competent. But I'm telling you, character will beat competence any day. Next slide. Booker T. Washington one of the early, early pioneer African-Americans said, character is power. Character is power. Now, many of you, I think many of you are too young. In 1990, how many of you were around? 1990? Now, something interesting happened. I was, I was, I was still in school. I was still in the primary school. Kuwait was invaded by um, Iraq. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And so America, Britain, the France, the Allied forces came together and they said, let's go and liberate Kuwait from Saddam. All right? It was, it was a very short war. Very interesting. It was called Operation Desert Storm. That was what it was called. Now, the guy who led that was a five-star general called General Norman Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf died 10 years ago, 2012. But Schwarzkopf said something about competence and character, which I want us to take note of. Can you go to the next slide? So that's Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell, who also became chief of defense staff in the U.S. Schwarzkopf says, to be a 21st century leader, you must have two things, competence and character. Listen, when a five-star general speaks, you had better listen. 
Yeah, because some of you, when Jesus speaks, you won't listen. So listen to the fa- <laughs> No. <laughs> he says, to be, a, to be a 21st century leader, you need competence and character. And then he said this. Listen, this is a general speaking. This is a soldier speaking. He says, leadership is a potent combination of strategy, or if you like, competence and character. But if you must be without one, be without strategy. <laughs> is this a soldier? Can you imagine a soldier saying this? That character is so important that if you should drop competence, drop it and rather keep the character. Hey! That is how important what we are talking about is, my friends. Some of you may know, if you are into investment and things like that, Warren Buffett, he's probably the wealthiest investor in the world. Warren Buffett said, listen, when I hire people, I hire for three things. I hire for smartness, I hire for energy, and I hire for integrity. But he says, I hire for integrity first. Before I think about the smartness and the energy and passion and enthusiasm. You know why? He says, because if I don't hire for integrity first, the person will kill me with the first two. <laughs> he will kill you with his smartness and his energy. If he says, in fact, he says, if you want to hire somebody without character, make sure the person is a fool. <laughs> And lazy. Yeah, because if the person is smart and hardworking, you are dead. If they don't have character. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh my goodness, character is so important. Let's go. What's the next slide? So that is what Schwarzko says you need in the 21st century. But God says we've always needed this, whatever the century. Because it's said about David that he shepherded Israel with integrity of heart. And skillfulness of hands. Same character and competence. And some of you are thinking, David, isn't he the guy who committed adultery? Yes, that one. But the thing about David is, as soon as he was brought aware of his wrong, forgive me, Lord. Comes clean before God. Because the fact that you, you have integrity does not mean that you are perfect. But that you are one with God. Clean hands and a pure heart. So what is character? Well, really, character is the heart of leadership. The matter of the heart is the heart of the matter. Don't you like that? Yes, you can put... The, what, 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 what is it? The matter of the heart is what? The heart of the matter when it comes to, to, to leadership. Next slide. People have said character is moral strength. I like what Os Guinness says. He's from the Guinness family. Okay, I'm not going to start controversies here. The, the, the inner form, he says, character is the inner form that makes a person who they are. It is the essential stuff a person is made of. The inner reality and quality in which thoughts, decisions, and behavior is rooted. And so when we come to Samson, you see certain decisions he makes. You see that there's something wrong with this guy because his decisions are based out of a certain inner reality and quality which is not correct. What is your character? Next slide. And then James says, James, this is just James from the Bible, James Hunter. <laughs> character in the classic sense manifests itself as the autonomy to make ethical decisions always on behalf of the common good. And the discipline to abide by that principle. So look at these definitions and ask yourself, do I have character? Because as we get into the story, you can be able to tell. We're going to look at 10 things about Samson. Hey. And then you can judge for me and whether he has character or not. Let me show you this diagram. It's one of my creative things that I did. So you know white light, all this light, this light, for example. When you pass it through a prism, it separates into the seven colors, right? In the red, orange, yellow, the, the rainbow, right? I, and you will see this anywhere. This is my original thing. So when you quote it somewhere, acknowledge me, yeah? Character, I think, when we say, so, so, so I was telling the, the Mercy and Co. that when we said we want to be values-based leaders, I said, well, let's, let's stick with character-based leaders because it's values plus other things when it comes to character. So character like white light, if you separate it, you will get values. You're all right? Your character is made of your values, your virtues, your attitudes, your morality, your ethics, your true self. Because every one of us has a true self and a false self. Some of you, your true self did not come to this conference. <laughs> and integrity. 
And integrity is like a belt that puts all of these together. Now let me see, let's do a quiz and see whether we understand these terms. Next slide. Next. So which one of these is values? Are you able to read from there? It's a bit small. Oh, all right. Well, you get the slide. So which one is values? Can I press? A value is something that is important to you. Press, press one more time. What is a value? A value is what you value. Something that's important to you. And so it guides your behavior. It determines how you make decisions. It determines how you live. But it's important to you. What are your values? I find that a lot of people in this generation, all we care about is money. Like that is our number one value. Money and possessions. You know, how, how you get it doesn't matter. Including pastors. Virtues. What are virtues? Vir virtues are those qualities, press again, you have only if you practice or live them out. Attitudes. Attitudes are, what are attitudes? Which of them? An established way, right, of thinking or feeling about things. So what is your attitude towards Kikuyus? You are saying, eh? What's your attitude towards women? That's part of your character. Let me tell you, the kind of transformation we need Jesus to do in us. You look at something and you're like, oh, something, oh, something. But what about you? What about me? Hey, do you know how in the international world, I work with Lausanne. Lausanne is something Billy Graham started in 1974. In the international world, people were talking about Kenya during the last, you know, the last, last election violence. And people said, we can't believe it. The country says they're, they're 70, 80% Christian. Where, where is their character? Where is their Jesus from nature? Hey, People are calling our Christianity into question because they don't see the transformation Jesus brings. Rwanda, when Rwanda fell in genocide, do you know the percentage of Christians that were in Rwanda? Does anybody know? 90%. How does a country that's 90% Christian kill themselves so? Hey, we need to come to Jesus and say, transform this heart. Transform this heart. Attitudes. Morality is what? It's generally accepted customs and behavior of a community. And it can change over time. I think morality is changing in Africa a lot. On the flight here, I saw so many young women who had come from Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa. All of, they, came to do some, they came to party in Ghana because there was this Afrochella and all of that. And I don't know what... The, so girls in this generation, have you decided that you wear bras anymore? <laughs> I am telling you, these girls were in the airport with their things all over the place. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> so mo morality is society-wide, okay? But ethics, ethics tends to be prescribed. So medical ethics, biomedical ethics. Ethics tends to be among a certain group, especially professional groups. And then, of course, your true self is the real you, your authentic self, as it was created to be without pretense or projection to be anyone or anything else. And then integrity. Integrity means being one. That is what, you, you studied math in school, integer. Integrity comes from the same root, integritas. Integer, it means you are one. Inter integers are what, whole numbers. What is the opposite of integers? Fractions. So do you have integrity? Are you whole or you are fractionated? Like some people, when they come and see you, some people in your village, when they come and see you at this conference, they won't believe it. <laughs> They say, hey! He's here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If you see him in the village, ay, 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 ay. the guy in the village is different. And then when you see him in Nairobi, he's different. And when you see him in the conference, he's different. And when you see him in church, hey, yeah, baba, hey, he's different. You don't have integrity. You are fractionated. Do you understand? <laughs> integrity is so important. And you see, many of us in Africa, we have high morality, low integrity. Can I explain? Oh, I don't have the time. Oh, we should have even got into the text. Listen, morality is what you say, I do this, I don't do this. I say, it's morality, right? But you say, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't sleep with people. That's high morality. But if you say that, but you do drink, you do smoke, you do sleep with people, you have low integrity. Right? Because you, you are doing what you said you don't do. But let me tell you, integrity can be a negative. There can, that, that is, there can be. <clears throat> like, another guy who says, Me, I drink, I smoke, I sleep with other girls in the fellowship. That's me. And then he does it.
You see, it's funny and it's weird, but that person has integrity. <laughs> do you understand what I mean? Because he says to me, this is what I do. And he does it. But you said this, I don't do. And you do it. <laughs> anyway, may we be people of true integrity. All right. So let's filter. One of the discussions you'd have is you're going to filter Samson's character through these things. Values. Check. What, what, did, what, what were his values? Did he have any virtues? What do you think of his ethics? Did he have any morality? I mean, for example, picking up the gates of a city, a city that hasn't done anything to you. You just came to sleep with your prostitute. How ethical is that? You know? So I love you to use your critical university mind to assess Samson through this. But now let me quickly go through 10 significant sins of Samson. Oh, oh Samson. 10 great stops. Because yesterday we had 10 great starts. He had everything laid for him. Four chapters of the Bible just for Samson. Angels announcing his, his birth. An angel announcing his birth. Filled with the spirit and everything. Ten great starts. But today we're talking about ten great stops. Because Judges 14 begins by saying, Samson went down to... I know that down there is geographical. He went down. But really he started going down. <laughs> he started from here the story just goes down he went down to Timna Timna was about three miles from Zora where his father was, where the family was so it wasn't far and he saw a young Philistine woman and when he returned he said to his father and mother I have seen a Philistine woman in Timna now get her for me for a wife is anybody saying, oh? No. Considering the powerful 25 verse pack chapter of Samson's setting and set up yesterday, chapter 13, 25 verses about just how he started out. What would you have supposed to be the kind of first words you hear from his mouth? From a person so anointed, so blessed by God. What, what do you think should have been the first thing to hear from Samson's mouth? Behold Israel, the Lord thy God is here, or something, right? Like, the first words we hear from Samson's mother, I have seen a woman. I have seen something. Hey! Oh, Lord Almighty. Oh, Samson. Samson, I have seen a woman. Ooh. Look, I, guess good, I get goosebumps thinking out of this story. But I have 15 minutes, so let's go. Number one, what were the 10 groups? Number one, he was not careful what he saw. <laughs> and you see this throughout the story. Now, all right? So because the first one, so Samson did not watch what he watched. I, I <laughs> the first one is this, I saw a woman, chapter 14, verse 1. Right? We just read that. Because the Bible says, yes, he saw the woman. And then he said in verse 2, I told the parents, I have seen. <laughs> he saw and I have seen. That was the first issue, the woman. But the second issue, if you look, if you go to verse 8, when he was going back, sometime later when he went back to marry the woman that he had seen, right? He turned aside to look. Right? So going straight on mission, he turned aside to look. What did he turn aside to look at? The carcass, the lion that he had killed earlier. And what did he see? Honey. So he was really into honey. <laughs> Women, honey, and honey, honey. <laughs> All right, honey. And then he quickly went there and scooped and ate. That's a problem. We'll come to why that's a problem shortly. And then again, you go to chapter 16, verse 1. One day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw this time. What did he see? A prostitute. That guy had a problem with his eyes. No wonder in the end, they were removed. <laughs> so, those of you who have a problem with your eyes, watch out. <laughs> uh, Jesus said, let him take care. Let him remove one for you now. So you go to hell with one eye rather than going to hell with both eyes. So, something so he told his parents what he had seen. You know, doesn't this go back to 1 John 2, 15 and 16? Where he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For everything in the world. What are the three things? The lust of the eyes, 
the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, or the boasting of what we have and do. The Bible says they don't come from God, they come from the world. The lust of the eye. Same three things in the Garden of Eden, the woman saw. She looked at the fruit and said, hey, she saw. And then she said, last of the flesh, this will be good for food, oh. Mm, if you eat this. And then pride of life, I will become like God. See, listen, the devil hasn't changed his strategy. Same thing. It's just that there are different human beings who come every hundred years. <laughs> Same strategy. Guys, let it be clear. Watch what you watch. Samson did not watch what he watched. He was not careful what he saw. I want you to go to the next slide because something very serious. This lady wrote this book, Eva, and she said, My friend Jack Samad with the National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families shocked me with the story of his attendance at the religious convention. The manager of the hotel where he had been staying noticed the posters and other paraphernalia he had carried through the lobby early one morning and then back in again later that afternoon. So he stopped Jack and asked him what he was doing with all that information on pornography. Jack told him he was part of the Christian conference being held in the city. And the manager just chuckled. <laughs> Get real, Jack. Porn movies in our hotel are accessed at a higher rate during Christian conventions than at any other time. And this is not the only incident. It's been actually been recorded. Because the hotels can track who's watching what. In fact, there was one uh, uh, conference, there were hundreds of youth pastors the, the, the rate of pornography watch list went like that. Vroom. Guys, and I know it's a problem. Research in the U.S., I don't know if we have done it in Kenya, research in the U.S. shows that 60% of Christian men watch porn and 20% of Christian women. It would be interesting to take a survey from here and see who here has a problem with their eyes. But Tell God, you have a purpose for me. You have an assignment from including Africa to the nations. And I cannot allow these eyes to get in the way. God, wash these eyes with your blood. Wash this heart with your blood. And I'm telling you, look, sometimes it's even... The problem with seeing things is that you can't unsee them. You know what I'm saying? So you are better not see. Because until you see, you can't say, oh, blah, 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 and, and do. <laughs> no, you have seen, you know. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So, rather not see. If you don't have things on your, you know, you can put programs on your on your computer that will not allow you to go on certain sites. There's even one that you can do and give somebody's email, so that as soon as you go to a site that is X-rated, it shoots an email to the person for accountability. If you are serious about the purpose God has for you, if you are not serious, then it's fine. If I watch with four eyes. No, no, no. If you are not serious about God's purposes, the fact that God wants to transform this world and he's inviting you to join him. If you are not serious about that, yeah, you can do whatever you like. But if you are serious, we've got to watch what we watch, my friends. God help us. Say God help us. Amen. That was Samson's first problem, his eyes. He did not... He was not careful what he saw. Number two, ay, 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 this one really gets my heart. Samson did not value what God values. You see, the <clears throat> first of all, it was not just a woman, 14 verse 1. He, it was a Philistine woman. Look at the scriptures, you know. Look at how his parents tried to persuade him. They, they said in chapter 14, verse 3, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all the people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She is the right one for me. God says, She is not the right one for you. Samson said, No. God, I am telling you. <laughs> you see, we all have to, in this liberal generation and all of that, decide that what is important to God will be important to me. In spite of how I feel, in spite of who says differently. He said, it's a right from, listen, you see such a poor sense of judgment when, we, we have such a poor sense of judgment when we don't value what God values. I feel this thing, what was the problem with that? God had warned them about, you know, getting involved with the Canaanites. 
So, for example, in Exodus 34, 16, the Bible says, Be careful, 15 and 16, Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you. And exactly that happened with Samson. And you eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Same thing, Deuteronomy chapter 7, 3 and 4. Furthermore, you will not intermarry with them. You shall not give, this is not because, this is not tribalism. This is godism. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn, they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. And of course, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, we see that Paul then explains to us, he says, because this is light and darkness. Do not be equally yoked with unbelievers. I used to pastor this Chinese church. I told you about it. And there was this young lady who was you know, going out with this totally unsaved person. And I had a lunch with her. And we talked about 2 Corinthians 6.14. To my shock, she said she never knew it was in the Bible. She knew it was a good suggestion. Like, don't marry if you can. If you can try, don't marry an unbeliever. You know? I didn't know that God had actually clearly said that. Listen, our God's values your values. And some of you get an unbeliever and you dress him up in suit and bring him to church. A well-dressed monkey is still a monkey. <laughs> so number one, he, so he did, not, he did not value what God valued in terms of the, the Philistine woman, right? But secondly, this is very important. He did not value the Nazarite vow. You know, the Nazarite vow, you can find that in Numbers chapter 6. Right? There were things they were not supposed to do. They were not supposed to drink alcohol. They were not supposed to go near dead bodies. He saw a dead body and went to it. Do you remember? Which dead body was that? The lion's dead body, the carcass. Why did he go to it? Because he saw honey. He did not value his vow. This is one of the clear instructions. Do you remember his mother even was not supposed to eat anything unclean? And neither was he. Huh. He broke his vow. He did not value his Nazarite vow. Secondly, about his Nazarite vow, he went drinking. How do I know? Because he goes partying. If you look at verse 10 and 11, the exact thing God said will happen. Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for the young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions, and they had a party. The word feast there, the Hebrew word translated feast there, is actually a one-week-long drinking party. When Nazarites were to abstain from alcohol, Samson ignored this vow. And again, we see in chapter 15, verse 15, picking a fresh jaw of a donkey. I had never seen it before until I was preparing for this. I said, isn't that also a carcass? Listen, it's amazing that God in his mercy allowed him to win a victory with that. But that is the mistake many of you make. I remember a young guy who went to fornicate. Do you understand what fornicate is? Yeah. And when you have sex, uh, uh, when you are not married, outside, uh, yeah. After he had finished doing his do, he started saying, Shabu, rara, baki, Oh, yes. The Spirit of God is still with me. Hallelujah. Hey, let me tell you something about God. Fear him. He can use a crooked stick. To draw a straight line. <laughs> and throw the stick away. John 15, he says, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. So the fact that God is using you, doesn't mean he approves of you. It's one of the most scary things. The fact that God is using you doesn't mean he's pre approves of you. In fact, the Bible says, Paul writes to Timothy, says there are many vessels. In fact, if you go to your house, the vessel that is used the most is probably the dustbin. <laughs> oh? <laughs> check it out and pee, check it out and pee, check it out and pee. It doesn't mean, but when you have guests, that's not the vessel you go and pay, bring. Hey. God can use Pharaoh. He can use Nebuchadnezzar. Time won't allow. Maybe tomorrow I'll go into the fact that the scripture says that although Samson chose this woman, God was using that to defeat the Philistines. We'll get, we can get into that later on. But uh, because of time, let me go through the others quickly. Samson did not value what God valued. Do you see it? In the woman, the Philistine woman he chose in this Nazarite vow that he broke. 
and of the God standards of marriage. This is such a funny phrase. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to visit my, I said, I'm, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father will not let him go in. Listen, Samson. The Bible says, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. And what, what is this about visiting your wife? Like, who visits their wife? <laughs> And I know that in this generation, we, we, we do marriage by Wi-Fi. Many of us, we marry and then go to Australia, go to Kenya, you know, and we are marrying by Wi-Fi. <laughs> be careful. Sometimes it's important, it's necessary, but be careful. Samson did not value God's, what God values. And I want to show you something that, it's an amazing story. I don't know whether you've seen it before from Jeremiah 35. Can we read it quickly? Oh, this is small. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. During the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Have you heard about the Rechabites? My goodness. They held on to their values. Even though it was not God's values. It was their family's values. God said, go to the Rechabite family and invite them to come to one of the side rooms of the house of the Lord. And give them wine to drink. So I went, with, I went to get Jezaniah, son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazinia, and his brothers and all his sons and the whole family of the Rechabites. I brought them where? Into the house of the Lord. <laughs> Into the room of the sons of Hanan, son of Igdalia, the man of God. It was next to the room of the officials, which was over the Messiah, son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Then I set bowls full of wine and some cups before the Rechabites. And I said to them, drink some wine. Are you see what's going on here? This is Prophet Jeremiah. Not the prophet on your television, Hope TV. No, 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 no. This is Jeremiah. And he has brought you where? Into the house of the Lord. And not just the house of the Lord. Into an inner room of a certain man of God. And he says, drink. What will you do? But they replied, we do not drink wine. Why? Because our forefather Jehonadab, son of Rechab, that's why they are called Rechabites, gave us this command. Neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. Also, you must never build houses, sow, plant, sow, sow seed or plant vineyards. You must never have any of these things, but must always live in tents. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. He says, we have obeyed everything. We have obeyed everything our forefather Jehonabab, son of Rechab, commanded us. Neither we, our wives, nor our sons and daughters have ever drunk wine or built houses to live in or had vineyards, fields, or crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed everything our forefather Jehonabab, Jehonadab commanded us. But when the book of Nazar, king of Babylon, invaded this land, we said, come, we must go to Jerusalem to escape the Babylonian and Arabian armies. So we have remained in Jerusalem. And what happened? Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, this is what the almighty God, the God of Israel says. Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem. Go and tell those in Nairobi, in Karen. Tell them those you know, in the Red Valley. Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words? Declares the Lord. Jehonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine and this command has been kept. To this day, they do not drink wine because they obeyed their father's command. But I, the Lord Almighty, Yahweh, creator of the heavens and the earth, I have spoken to you not once, nor twice, nor thrice, again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again I sent my servants, the prophets, to you. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I have given you and your ancestors, but you have not paid attention or listened to them. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have carried out their forefather, the command their forefather gave them. But these people, including Samson, have not obeyed me. Values. And these people are even living by values that, like, don't build a house. How, how is that a value to me? But they lived by it. Do you value what God values? You can fault our Muslim friends all you like. But they value what the prophets have said. And if you fool around with their prophet. <laughs> but the Christians. Jesus. Do you value what your father has said? 
Samson, they're not value. Hey, where am I? Huh? Two? We have to close. Let me run through the others quickly. Number three, ungodly appetites or lust of the flesh. Remember, we talked about that. He saw the, she saw the Philist, he saw the Philistine, right? Again, chapter 14, verse 9, the honey from the carcass, then parting away, right? Parting but not fulfilling his purpose. Especially parting with the enemy. Oh my goodness, the one he was supposed to deliver them from. And then, of course, he goes to a prostitute. Samson's a total womanizer. Oh my goodness, ungodly appetites, the last of the flesh. Next one, number four, unguarded appetites. So, the two are not the same. You can have an ungodly appetite and guard it, and lock it, and say, hey, no, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> but it was, he not only had ungodly appetites, they were also unguarded. Because when he feels like it, he's like, it's got to happen. That's what he said to his parents. He said, in the, in chapter 14, verse 2, he said, get her for me now. Right? Chapter 14, verse 3, B. Get her for me now, 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 now. I'm burning up. I'm burning up. My heart's on fire. I'm burning up. <laughs> the guy had uncontrollable appetites. Whether it was for women or it was for honey or even water. Do you remember, if you go to chapter 15, verse 18, after he had defeated, you know, with the, with the donkey's uh, jaw, because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory, now must I die of thirst? Give me water! Give me water now! <laughs> Somebody prayed to God, he said, God, give me patience, and I need it now. <laughs> of course, you need it. Oh my goodness. Of course, in chapter 16, verse 4, we'll talk about the Delilah story tomorrow. But how does that story start? It says, some time later, Judges 16, 4, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek. Uncontrolled appetites. Even anger. Look at chapter 14, verse 19, 19b and 20. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. And that's how his wife was given to somebody else. Burning with anger. Ah! uncontrolled, unguarded emotions. One day we'll probably do something on emotional intelligence. Even the world knows that you've got to recognize your emotions and be able to manage them. Even the world. Not something. Number five, he was economical with the truth. You know, he was not forthright with the truth at all. You know, he enjoyed the honey with his parents. He didn't tell them where the honey came from. Do you remember? The Bible says, he, but he did not tell them, verse 9 of chapter 14, that he had taken the honey from the lion. What do you think his parents would have done? Hey! Yay, God forbid! Yay! Haram! Whatever! You know? He didn't tell them. By the way, some of us, that's how we are. On Sunday, I deceived somebody. Yeah, I'm confessing my sins. <laughs> and it was on Sunday. Ooh, ironic. But why do I say deceive? Sometimes, we don't tell a lie. But we don't tell the whole truth. <laughs> and all of you are university students, so you know how to do it a lot. <laughs> so you tell your parents that we are supposed to buy notebooks for geo and gra and phi. Geography, three books. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, but listen, listen. Let me give you an example of deception, all right? So a man is walking his dog, and then somebody comes to him and says, Ah, does your dog bite? He says, oh, no. And so he starts patting the dog, and the dog goes, nyang, nyang, and bites him. I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. He said, yes, my dog doesn't bite, but this is not my dog. <laughs> Samson was economical with the truth. He wouldn't tell his parents. You know, even the riddle, you remember, he, he didn't tell his wife. And then he told his parents that, he told his wife that even, I haven't even explained to my parents. Even my parents. Guys, don't be, and of course, you know how long he played with Delilah. This game, oh, do this my hair. Okay, do this man, you know. Economical with the truth. Ah, be careful about that. Number, number, number six, I just want to finish this so that, um, number six, oh, sin slippery slope. You know, <laughs> he began with a prostitute in chapter 14, verse 1. Soon he ended with a, no, so he began with a pagan wife. Chapter 14, verse 1. Soon he ended with a prostitute. Sin is a very slippery slope. You start a little, oh, let me, let me just try a little. The next thing you know, the next thing you know, the next thing you know, you are the dealer. 
it's, it's a very sleepy. Let me tell you something. If you are here and you are in a sinful relationship, or you're doing something sinful, thank God that it's being called out today. I am telling you, thank God. Listen. Let me tell you something that happened to me in North America. You know, in Africa, we tend to be very, oh, wonderful. You know, we're very emotion expressive. Say, so, oh, you beautiful young lady. Oh, wow. You know, and sometimes we even call people, oh, sweetheart. I can say, oh, mercy. This is so sweetheart. Come, come. In North America, there was once a lady, a young lady that I said to, so, oh, you're so beautiful. I, I, I mean, I've been to many places in the world. You're one of the most beautiful people I've seen. Went to report to the church. <laughs> Me. <laughs> oh, no, serious. I'm telling you. This, I, I don't think I've shared this in public before. <laughs> Listen, I, I am so strict about my sexuality. I married as a virgin. I married at 28 as a virgin. My wife was 23 going to 24. She was also a virgin. In fact, we made it a celebration in Ghana. There was a revolution in Ghana. We actually, we actually called the marriage a celebration of purity, purpose, and passion. And we wore white, both of us, intentionally. Because we created, in fact, we created such a revolution that the people who were sleeping around now began to feel bad. Because first they were making us feel bad. They said we are stupid, we can't, you know. And now I showed them, look at my seven children. You thought I couldn't do it. <laughs> Shit. Uh, look at you. <laughs> ah, it's because we are values-based. It's because we are character-based. It's because we have a God. Shit. Ha. Anyway, so like imagine a person like me, totally shocked that this had gone to the pastor. So in fact, I was supposed to do uh, you know, something in the church. The pastor called me and said, we're not going to, we're canceling the program. You know, because, you know, I mean, the guy was literally talking to me like, like, like I was the next Ravi Zacharias or something. <laughs> oh, it broke my heart. I, 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 I called my wife. I mean, like, I, I, because my, 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 I'm very open with my wife. And my wife actually knows the person too, you know. But you know why I'm telling you this? I thank God that it happened when it did. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because who knows what else I would have said to somebody and the next thing you know, it's in the newspapers or something and somebody totally misunderstands. And mis Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you, thank God that you were caught watching over the fence. Because if we are caught inside the fence, <laughs> please quickly wear your underwear and stop it. Just, just stop it. Now, because sin is a very, very slippery slope. Number seven, he was a show off. Look at the ridiculous offer. That he said, let me tell you where Redo, 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 Redo. If you can give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30, 30 underwear. Who needs 30 underwear? 30 and linen, and linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. That's what linen is. Don't wash your dirty linen in public. That's what it is. All right? If you can't tell me the answer, he was a show off. Don't be a show off. The Bible calls it the pride of life. The boasting of what we have and what we do. That's a challenge with this generation. You see, he was smart. Look at the way he did the words. Out of the eater, something eat, to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Hey, you know, smart but not wise. That's this generation. Everything is smart. Smartphones, smart TV. You know there's even smart concrete. Everything is smart except the people. <laughs> may you not just be smart, may you be wise. Number eight, covetousness. So, so you see, go back, go back one. So the, 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 go back one, please. Let me just show you something. The, no, one, go back one. Yes. So for the pride, it was, I will give you 30 linen garments. Look at such a ridiculous offer, right? And 30 sets of clothes. But for the covetousness, next slide, is you must give me 30 linen garments. Like, what do you need 30 clothes for? Some of you, that's the thing. It's crazy. And some of you are going to become Christian politicians. Stop the stealing. How many cars can you drive? How many beds can, beds can you sleep on? Like you put your leg one, leg two, hand one, hand two. How many beds do you need? Oh my goodness. You know, there are two kinds of politicians in Ghana. There are those times up. There are those who chop our money. Do you use the word chop in Kenya? Chop. Eh? There are those who chop our money, money wearing... They, they do it like this. You don't realize they are chopping. They're like this. Hmm. 
they are siphoning our money in smart deals and you know mm. but there are also some other politicians they don't even have the courtesy to eat nicely they put their legs in their hands in their everything they're just chopping the money covetousness and pastors too somebody went to give their pastor to, their car to a pastor to bless it the pastor took the car yeah he took the car Last but one, last but one, sorry, my time is up. I, 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 I need to apologize. Um, so, solo living and leading, all right? Do you realize, have you seen that in the, in the party? You know, a party is one of the places you can be most lonely. There are many people there, but you are lonely. He had all these companions, but he had no friends. Look throughout the story of Samson. He is never with anybody as a friend or even as a team member. Totally solo. And let me tell you something. If you are a solo person here, that is the best strategy for the devil. Ah, you people are in Kenya. I don't even have to take you far. Let's just go to the game reserve. Who are the ones the lion goes after? When they see a group of wild beasts or whatever. It's the one who is alone, separated from the rest. Samson, who was his accountability person? Who? Nobody. I walk alone. <coughs> Let's end with the last one so we can go. He was selfish and self-centered. <clears throat> Look at his abuse of power. <laughs> I mean, you go and do your riddle. People who have nothing to do your riddle, you go and kill 30 of them. <laughs> uh, abuse of power. I mean, totally abusive. Look at, and what is the sense after selfish, sinful act of fornication and prostitution? You go there, you are lying there until midnight, you get up, you take hold of the city gates, you tear them loose with the bar and everything, and what? Like, what kind of creature is this? So selfish, so self centered. So you see that in his abuse of power, of his abuse of his strength, all right, the strength that was supposed to be used to save his people. But again, you see how he's vengeful vengeful for some of us vengeance is our thing and that is what will take us down take god you are the god of vengeance i release this person to you three times samson is vengeful look at let me read chapter 15 verse 3 to 6 samson said to them this time i have the right to get even with the philistines i will really harm them that's when they took his wife right and then he tied the fox's tails and released them to burn all the grain oh then in chapter 15, verse 11, Samson said to them, since you acted like this when they went to burn the father's and, and the wife's place, he said, since you acted like this, I swear. Is anybody like that here? I swear I will do you some. I will repay you. He said, I will stop until I get my revenge on you. This is chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. Oh my goodness. In the, the, verse 11, he says in chapter 15, I merely did to them what they did to me. Look at, again, chapter 16, verse 28. That's when he prayed his final prayer. We'll look at that tomorrow. But even then, he says, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more so that I revenge. <laughs> that was his final prayer. I revenge for my two eyes. <laughs> uh, I want to leave you with this. So he was selfish and self-centered in terms of, you can see that in his abuse of power and his strength. You see that in his vengefulness. But you also see how Samson hardly connects with God. Have you realized that Samson hardly prays? He prays twice in the whole of his life, at least the recorded part. <laughs> and, and both times he prays, it's not about God's purposes. It's about his selfish needs. Listen, that is a problem. When we are self-sufficient... We don't even see the need for prayer. I want us to close. Can you just give the assignment and then we, we, we pray? Next slide. So these are just basically the points here. Number one, leadership is built on the foundation of character, not competence, and not charisma. Bottom line, watch out for the same big three temptations. Possessions, pleasure, power, or money, sex, power. Right? And the same three mechanisms, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And all men, male men, female men, are still God's method. As flawed as we are, and we'll talk about that tomorrow when we look at Samson's legacy. As weak as we are, in spite of the mistakes we are, somehow God has still chosen that his method is men. When Jesus returned to heaven, 
Everybody's like, oh, wow, you're back. I say, yeah. Who have you left the work with? So, oh, yeah, you know, Peter, James, John. Peter? James? John? Yeah. Somehow, he's chosen us. In spite of how flawed we are. We'll talk about that tomorrow. All right? And then when we are unfaithful to God, you see, he will remain faithful. God is God. He can even use our unfaithfulness. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. But we'll still pay the price. Sometimes there's other people who will be unfaithful to us. You see what Delilah did to him. You see what the father-in-law did to him. You will pay in a way. But God will accomplish his purposes. But isn't it great if God will accomplish his purposes through our obedience? Because God will do what he will do, with or without you. I'd rather that he did it with me. And I'd rather that he did it through my obedience and not in spite of me or even against me. We forget, we like to say, if God be for you, who can be against you? But if God be against you, who can be for you? <laughs> Let's pray. I apologize, I went a, a bit above time because of these announce announcements that I made. I apologize. Can we bring our hearts before the Lord? Now, tomorrow we'll be doing something very special. We are all leaders, but we are all sinners. But today, just for this moment, look at all these things, the things that stopped Samson. Do you see yourself in any of that? Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the porter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. God, may you do cardiac surgery on us right now. Like David said, create in me a clean heart, oh God. <laughs> and renew a right spirit within me. You know what is wrong with each of our hearts here. How sick our hearts are. Whether it is sex related. Whether it's pornography related. Whether it's money related. Stealing. Cheating in exams. Christian Union chairperson. Cheating in exams. God. That word create in me a clean heart, that word is bara. It's to make out of nothing. Just like God created the world out of nothing. God, give us new hearts. You say in Ezekiel, I'll give you a new heart. I'll take away your heart of stone. Take away this heart of fornication. Take away this prideful heart. Take away this vengeful heart. Take away this, this, this heart that does not value what you value. And give us a heart of flesh. And fill us with your spirit to move us so that we'll be careful to keep your commands and obey you in your ways, oh God. You know, in the end, our character issues will catch up with us. It doesn't matter whether you are Samson or you are Bill Clinton. It will catch up with us, every one of us. And so we had better do business with God now. 
there's somebody here you are going out with two women in the fellowship two women two girls you are seeing this one and you are seeing this one and you're sleeping with them both the lord says today is a full stop in love he is warning you because the next thing might be judgment stop it because God wants to do something awesome with you look at the awesome things he wanted to do with Samson and what he fell for God help us Lord we want to see revival on our campuses we want to see revival in this country but it will begin with us as leaders it will begin with me as a preacher as an expositor Make us more and more like Jesus. Make us more and more intimate with Jesus. So that we can lead more and more to Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. The Fellowship of Christian Unions. Reaching students. Changing nations.